I, I think of Ted as one of the last remaining characters in philosophy. <laughs> and, when I, and when I say that, I mean he puts his character into his philosophy in a way which is uh, almost extinct uh, in an era of philosophical mass production. I mean, to use a sort of brewing metaphor, uh, I, uh, if it wasn't so inappropriate, I would be inclined to liken Ted to a microbrewery, um, you know, in, in a world where uh, everyone's drinking uh, flavourless uh, lager. Um, but of course, but he does, he does produce a very strong brew with a very characteristic flavour, and not least in his work on terrorism. Uh, for 40 years, Ted has pursued the unpopular project of acting as an advocate for what is called the violence of the left, the violence involved in those terrorist campaigns which stand a reasonable chance of getting, as he puts it, freedom and power for a people when it is clear that nothing else will get it for them. These are his words on the notorious page 151 of Ted's book, After the Terror. Now, hang on. We're a little late in the day. And I'd like to ask you a question right now. Oh, dear. If, if you think that the only way an enslaved people can become free is through violence, do you say they cannot take that only means? Well, you'll have to see when I finish the paper. All right. <laughs> Uh, 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 those were Ted's words on the Torah's page 151 of After the Terror, in which Hondrich asserted that the Palestinians have exercised a moral right in their terrorism against the Israelis, and thereby called down a well-known storm upon his head. It requires courage and perseverance to act as Hondrich has, in a way that few philosophical projects can require them. And one of the questions I want to keep in mind in discussing his project is what might thus be required of us in our role as philosophers. Hondrich's own answer uh, derives from his view of political philosophy as indeed advocacy. Political philosophers, he writes, are inevitably more like barristers, as distinct from judges, than is allowed by certain high conceptions of their subject, and it is best to admit it. No doubt they are advocates more or less convinced of the rightness of their cases, but they are advocates nonetheless. Barristers are, of course, confronted by opposing advocates, and it's crucial to bear this in mind when considering Hondrich's claims. They are not, as he is modestly conceding, magisterial. They are meant to present a case that stands only if opposition to it falls, and they need to be scrutinised in this spirit. In practising philosophy as advocacy, Hondrich stands in a long and honourable tradition that stretches through, among many others, Bertrand Russell, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. Like the last two, Hondrich is a consequentialist, basing the positions he advocates on their consequences, in his case, on their consequences for getting and keeping people out of bad lives. Hondrich's principle of humanity here is the fundamental principle which he believes is needed when we're considering questions of right and wrong in politics. It expresses, he thinks, a morality to which we're all committed and committed by our human nature, a nature which involves, on the one hand, our great desires for certain goods, and on the other, our rationality, which requires us to acknowledge the general scope of the reasons such desires provide. Since bad lives are ones we would not wish to be plunged into, we are therefore obliged to try and keep others out of them. Terrorism is prima facie wrong because it does kill people and spoil lives. But it's possibly rightful if the principle of humanity would adjudicate in favour of using these means to get other people out of bad lives at the cost of these ills. In formulating and employing his principle of humanity, Hondrich shows that his interest in discussing various cases of terrorism, including the Palestinian one, is indeed philosophical, as much as political. The question he is addressing is the clearly philosophical one of how we can determine the rights and wrongs of terrorist acts. The principle of humanity gives us a general method to apply so that, as with all consequentialist principles, we then need to look at the facts about likely consequences to see if an act can be endorsed or ought to be condemned. 
What is hardest about morality, writes Hondrich, are questions of fact. So in endorsing Palestinian terrorism, one thing Hondrich is doing is making a factual claim about the likelihood of its success in alleviating many bad Palestinian lives at the price of making a relatively small number of Israeli lives worse, including just ending them. Here, someone may think, Hondrich has stepped out of his philosophical shoes, and yet any consequentialist must do so in drawing specific conclusions. So we cannot say that in advocating a particular political position here, Hondrich has somehow crossed a line that philosophers should not cross. We can, however, ask in what capacity he and others make such a judgment if not simply as philosophers? The answer, I think, is that they make it as citizens. The court in which Hondrich acts as an advocate is the court of public opinion. And the point of trying to influence it is to have an effect on public policy. It is as citizens that we may expect to have such an effect, in the first place, as citizens trying to affect policy in our own countries, but more broadly, through addressing also citizens of other countries so that they may have an effect on policy in theirs. We can see that this is what Hondrich is aiming to do through the fact that he calls for changes in policy towards Israel and the Palestinians, not only from Britain, but from the US and other countries too. On the face of it, there's no contradiction in performing the role both of philosopher and citizen simultaneously in advocating policy positions on philosophical grounds. Russell, Mill and Bentham all did so, and most famously, Socrates' argument for drinking the hemlock is made in both capacities. There is, however, a potential tension between the roles. As a philosopher, Hondrich formulates a principle which brings order and consistency to the judgments he makes on its basis. But as an advocate in the court of public opinion, he surely needs to carry as many of the jury along with him as he can. It cannot be assumed that all of them will wish to subscribe to the principle of humanity or indeed to any consequentialist principle. Some may have deontological convictions, despite Hondrich's view that, I'm quoting here, all deontological morality is in fact lower stuff, dishonourable stuff, an abandoning of humanity of the decent part of our nature. Those with deontological inclinations are scarcely likely to give them up on being told this. Advocacy is the art of persuasion, and in persuading those whose initial instincts are to condemn Palestinian terrorism, the less general the grounds on which the advocate relies, the better. For the more general they are, the more disputable they will probably be. While on the other hand, greater generality may suit one's philosophical urge for system. That's the tension, I think. Hondrich does not rely only on the principle of humanity in arriving at his judgments. He uses it rather to organise and justify them. Thus he says that the wrong of 9-11 is to be taken as a kind of datum, a moral truth that has general moral principles as its possible consequences. Most people would share his reaction. His task then in trying to convince uh, people that Palestinian terrorism is not similarly wrong is to expose the differences between the cases. Now here, Hondrich has been criticised for distinguishing 9-11 as wrong, quoting, because there could be no certainty or significant probability, no reasonable hope that it would work to secure a justifying end, but only a certainty that it would destroy lives. But as Jerry Cohen has observed, the criticism that terror is counterproductive does not criticise it as terror. But it, it is as terror that Palestinian suicide bombings and so forth do strike many as wrong. So it, it, is to, it is some other aspect of them that needs to be shown if this judgment is to be overturned. I shall move then to discuss what Hondrich has to say in his role as advocate to reveal this aspect which might justify Palestinian terrorism. Hondrich defines terrorism as violence short of war, political illegal and prima facie wrong. In thinking of it as short of war, he clearly conceives it as having the same aims as war. So when we look at his justification of Palestinian terrorism by contrast with acts like 9-11, we can usefully employ the old just war notion of its jus ad bellum. 
So Hondrich thinks that the Palestinians have a just cause which they can pursue by no other means than violence and that their violence is not hopeless. His view of the Palestinians' just cause is in fact very complex. In After the Terror, he seems to see it principally in terms of a right of national self-determination. Peoples, he writes, demand the freedom that is the running of their own lives in a place to which their history and culture attaches them. Lives are bad if they lack this satisfaction, but also, according to Hondrich's principle of humanity, if people lack respect and self-respect, adequate material <coughs> goods, opportunities for culture and for relationships, all of which apply to the Palestinians. Hondrich sums this up and adds to it in Humanity, Terrorism, Terrorist War, writing that Palestinian terrorism has, has been self-defense, resistance to ethnic cleansing, self-preservation, the preservation of the existence of a people. These various wrongs against which the Palestinians are fighting seem to me to have very different weights. And to my mind, Hondrich lays too much stress on one rather than the others. In particular, I am unconvinced by Hondrich's claim that the value of a people's freedom and power in their homeland has been better demonstrated historically than any other good, his words, and that our nature is a proof of it. Now, a skeptical response would be that the nationalism seemingly implied by these remarks is a comparatively recent phenomenon and a very dangerous one. People may indeed desire what Hondrich says they do, perhaps, but perhaps they're misguided to do so when something much more ideologically modest in terms of a right of separate and autonomous government would guarantee them the other great goods they need in order to avoid bad lives. However, Hondrich seems to place his greatest stress in defending Palestinian terrorism on what I've called this national self-determination argument for he spends considerable time aiming to demonstrate that the Palestinians have proved by their struggle that at, last, that, that, that at least as early as 1948, they were a people with the self-consciousness of a people, which is not something that came to them only later. Now, again, I find this unconvincing. Isaiah Berlin attributes nationalism to people being... This is, Berlin's words, like Schiller's bent twig, which always jumped back and hit its bender. And he imputes German nationalism to the humiliations Germans experienced through not being given the respect accorded to the supposedly culturally superior French. Now, a similar story could be told about the Palestinians in relation to the Jewish settlers who came to form and expand the state of Israel it seems plausible to suppose that it's precisely in response to the way the Israelis treated Palestinians that they came to think of themselves as a distinct people or nation. On this conception, resistance caused by lack of respect and self-respect is viewed as an engine for creating nationhood. Contrary to Hondrich's claim, this cannot be the case since the Palestinians already being a people is necessary to account for their resistance. On the alternative view, the resistance to humiliation staged by political organizations is what gets people to think of themselves as a nation by gathering their support for restoring a sense of pride. Furthermore, the fact that the resistance is violent is just what we would expect on this account if their nationalism is a reaction to humiliation, for this will invoke, evoke indignation to be overcome only by heroic acts. Uh, sorry, the humiliation is to be overcome only by heroic acts. Yet does this alternative account weaken the Palestinian case for using violence? I don't think so. Rather, it shifts the emphasis to all those other ills that the Palestinians have suffered and for which a separate and autonomous government, perhaps only to be obtained through violence, may be the sole remedy. Partial answer to uh, Ted's question, his interruption. So it may well be thought that a stronger case for it can be made by adverting to self-defense, resistance to ethnic cleansing, self-preservation, in Hondrich's words, as more important than 
the preservation of the existence of a people conceived in nationalist terms. And if these aims are more important, then they might better serve to justify the prima facie wrongs of taking the lives of those who represent the threat and the attack. These aims will provide the just ad bellum for Palestinian fighters, and it is Honiter's achievement to have, so to speak, normalised their actions within this framework, which most people, not just those uh, who are consequentialists like him, might accept. However, the other element of just war theory is just in bellow, and its cardinal principle is that the innocent should not be targeted. Even if it is accepted that Palestinians have a case for violence, the character of that violence will still need to be questioned. Hondrich does not rightly, to my mind, define terrorism, as lots of authors do, in terms of attacks upon the innocent. But the suicide bombers he defends do kill and maim them. How does he justify this? Hondrich is understandably sceptical of the way the doctrine of double effect is used to defend the inviction of so-called collateral damage upon civilians. But the point of the just war prohibition is independent of this doctrine about intentions. Its point is that civilians are not legitimate targets, so that if they are killed or wounded, it must only be as the effect of attacking a military target. So Palestinian suicide bombers who target civilians are not in the same position as the gunship pilots who kill civilians in the process of securing a military objective. The Palestinian terrorists may indeed lack any military targets to attack, but that they would have attacked these had they been available does not so far justify their attacks upon civilians in the way in which choosing targets with as little risk to civilians as possible may justify attacks involving such casualties when they cannot be avoided. Now, Hondrich may be right that the Palestinians would often prefer other methods and regret the civilian casualties they cause. Yet, the problem with the identity politics into which nationalism may lead them is that the conflicts it engenders are not, as on Rousseau's account of war, ones in which, Rousseau's words, the individuals who become involved are enemies only by accident. In identity politics, ordinary people become, uh, 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 be become enemies because one identity group reacts against being despised, demeaned, disrespected and denied due recognition by the other. This leads to hatred and anger against members of that other group which readily spills over into communal violence <coughs> and the deliberate targeting of ordinary civilians by militants. In these circumstances, the civilian immunity which Justin Bellow demands is no longer respected, since the motivation required for it is lacking. Regrettably, this seems to be the situation which has recently, anyway, arisen in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, so that the Palestinian bombers may well not regret killing their civilian targets. Nor, it might be added, may Israeli soldiers regret the civilian casualties they cause when they are moved by indignation at Palestinian actions and aspirations or contempt for their culture. The Imbello rules, which apply to terrorism as much as to full-scale war, are in place precisely to counter these attitudes and the evils they bring about when armed conflict arises. They need not be regarded as mysterious deontological edicts, but rather as principles governing the performance of a certain role, namely that of soldier or irregular fighter acting on behalf of ordinary people. Principles, regula principles regulating roles may be regarded as moral principles if the role is such that its proper performance can be viewed as morally good. Such principles are grasped by understanding the point and requirements of the role. In the case of soldiers, regular or irregular, the point is in large part the protection of civilians. The rule of civilian immunity recognises this by acknowledging the special status they have on one's opponent's side as well as on one's own. This is partly a matter of expediency. If a soldier targets the other side civilians, then his side civilians are likely to be targeted too and his task of protecting them is made harder. 
but it also limits the role to combat with other fighters in a way that makes possible pride in its performance, which is a very different thing from whatever grim gratification might be obtained by killing members of an opposing identity group. Earlier I suggested that the judgments one makes on such matters as the rights and wrongs of Palestinian bombings are made from one's position as a citizen. As citizens, we have, I suggest, a strong interest in maintaining the rule of civilian immunity and ensuring that those who fight on our behalf adhere to it. This will make us very reluctant to condone breaches of the rule. Arguably, adherence to it will reduce the overall amount of suffering that conflict could otherwise, would otherwise cause, and thus can, in principle, it seems to me, be justified on consequentialist grounds. But how this can be compared with the loss of opportunity to mitigate bad lives that Hondrich argues the Palestinian campaign provides, I do not know. This does not, however, seem to fully explain the revulsion we feel at attacks upon civilians, particularly by suicide bombers, irrespective of the cause for which they fight. This is due, I think, to the chilling experience of being hated just for who we are, for being targeted because of our, for our, for our identity and not for anything we do, as we would be if we were combatants who do things that might invite retaliation or pose a threat, and that we are to be killed or maimed for who we are is especially disturbing if those who target us are themselves prepared to die encompassing our deaths. One of the reasons I want to say we, we try to cling on to the principle of civilian immunity is that without it we risk being treated not just as citizens who are enemies in Rousseau's words by accident but as enemies through the designs of those who hate us. Now, the wrong of 9-11 is taken as a moral datum, I think, in large part because it has this background, this background of hatred owing to identity. However different Palestinian terrorism may have been, and I think I agree with Ted that, it, that, that, that it, at the one time it was, it seems to have often morphed into something where hatred rather than hope has become its moving force, blurring the distinction between it and jihadism, where religious supersedes national identity. International law, which seeks to enforce rules like that of civilian immunity, does not make distinctions between just and unjust causes in doing so. It reflects the tragic view that either, either cause can, unless constrained, wreak havoc when bright designs fail, and turn to vengefulness and indiscriminate violence. As citizens, I suggested, we have an overwhelming interest in supporting it. And this is reason enough, I think, for not joining Hondrich in endorsing Palestinian violence despite their cause. But this is not to say that we should unreservedly condemn it. Like Hondrich, as he reports in his earlier book, Violence for Equality, <coughs> when the Oxford Union debated the violence of the IRA, uh, he sat upon the cross benches and it's possible to acknowledge moral complexities by doing so. The moderate scepticism which this reflects is what might be expected from us as philosophers. But Hondrich has demonstrated that conviction too is compatible with this calling even though it must be bought at a considerably higher price. Perhaps as citizens, if not as philosophers, is sometimes demanded of us that we do get off the fence and publicly approve or disapprove of political actions. We must, of course, consider the consequences of doing so. And this, again, is largely a, a matter of fact on which philosophers have no special expertise. Whether they have any special expertise on the ethical aspects of the question, I'm talking here about the question of whether we should go public with, and get off the fence, uh, 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 is, is, uh, 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 it seems to me a difficult question. Um, whether they can be, uh, um, whether they do, I think, depends on whether they can be more confident of the greater soundness of the arguments they would produce in favour of the position they publicly advocate than ordinary citizens can. 
for to advocate a particular position without that confidence being justified would be irresponsible. Whether one agrees with his conclusions or not, the clarity and force of Hollitley's argument for it seems to me to show what sort of thing is needed to justify that confidence. I'm glad I have only a few minutes because <laughs> the subject is overwhelming. What is it to not respect the principle of civilian mm -hmm. immunity, as you called it? What is it to um, intend to kill innocents? Well, I'll tell you, Americans are doing a lot of it right now because what it is to intend to kill innocents is to take a course of action such that reasonable foresight with respect to it will accept the deaths of innocents. Given that the Americans are hard at it daily, and indeed uh, we'll join them to the extent that we can, I'm afraid you'll have to take the view that you can't make an awful lot of use of that particular principle well, of reflection in this to, part. To interrupt you, as you on, interrupted me, me. This is, the question here is proportionality. You see, I didn't speak of that. What, you know, I would agree with you about the American actions, but what's wrong with the American actions is not that they, are, that they have non-military targets, but, that in, but that in attacking the military targets, they are having a disproportionate effect upon civilians, which is also contrary to the rules of war. Well, it seems you and I agree about this. We agree on a lot, yeah. In which case, uh, since, uh, to mention another matter, in the uh, last great war in which we were involved, we engaged in what was called terror bombing. And indeed, it was uh, intended to, uh, amongst other things, throw people into fright. Now, virtually everything you can say about terrorism is such that uh, it isn't the case that it counts as a very effective rebuttal of the moral rightness of it. And what I really want to say here is that the question is difficult. Not that I have got the right answer, but that the question is difficult. And anybody who thinks it's not difficult has never, for example, thought of what it is to intend to kill an innocent. What it is to intend to kill an innocent is to do something with the reasonable anticipation that it might do that. All the stuff about terrorism is, it seems to me, um, pretty dubious. Let me just mention some other facts since I'm a little tired of this state and I can't quite master a good reply to what you had to say. I have a bit of notoriety because of two words, moral right, moral right, and you repeated them. But they quoted them, yep. Yes, and indeed what I said is that the Palestinians have a moral right to their terrorism against neo-Zionism, not Zionism, not the existence of the State of Israel, but neo-Zionism, where that is the taking of at least the liberty of the Palestinians in the last one-fifth of that place of which they are the original people. And uh, that was thought to be an irritating thing to say, that they have a moral right to um, engage in what is also, as you rightly remarked, their liberation struggle and many other things. Is it an extraordinary thing to assert a moral right to violence? Well, I might point out to you that uh, neo-Zionism, 
daily asserts a moral right to the violence in which it engages against the Palestinians, the savage and unspeakable attack on Gaza, the killing of children and all that is exactly defended whether or not they take up the philosophical usage by neo-Zionism. So I can't say that I am too upset by what you didn't say, but might have implied that I'm a little tougher than other people. <laughs> I'm no tougher than neo-Zionists, I can assure you, for a start. Citizens and philosophers. I'm not quite sure what a citizen is, but is he someone who tries to uh, engage in the discussion of his society? Well, in that case, I should have thought perhaps there was a moral obligation to philosophers to do a little mm -hmm. more that citizenly may, may engaging. Right. Yep. And uh, I shan't immediately give it up. I think there I end. I'm not quite sure what identity politics is, and you know and have written about it. <laughs> so say briefly how identity politics gets into this well, and, how it bears well, on, I, and how it bears on the mistake that I made in defending the terrorism of the Palestinians. Well, I, 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 didn't, uh, I, I didn't think you were making a mistake in defending um, the, the Palestinians' um, campaign. Uh, the terrorism. On, uh, well, hold on. On the assumption that they were respecting the rules of war. Okay? Uh, and um, the, the part of your argument I was taking object, objection to was the stress you were placing on what I called the right of Palestinian national self-determination, what I call, and you... And I you, certainly you, didn't. You, no, but you, 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 you spoke in terms of... Um, uh, I, 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 I had the quotation somewhere or other. Um, the... Um, find it. Um, hmm? Yes, that's that's the one. Um, the um, yeah, it, it's the uh, you know the bit about the um, uh, the right of the Palestinians to um, run their own affairs um, in you know a, a, a land to which. Uh, in a place to which their history and culture attaches them. I mean, that seems to me to be uh, a kind of um, a, a, cla a classic expression of, of a certain kind of Isn't nationalism. Um, and then you go on to you go on to speak about does identity politics get into that? Yes, absolutely. Nationalism is a form of identity politics. Nationalism conceived in those sort of terms. And to want a place to which one's history entitles one, is to do something wrong? Uh, well, because <laughs> entitles. <laughs> well, sorry, you're, you're, in, entitles. Sorry, your, your forebears have lived there. Well. Um, is that a reason for? No, uh, I, I don't think it's a very, very strong reason for waging the sort of campaign that I think the Palestinians do have a very strong reason to wage, um, namely that they are being treated appallingly badly. That seems to me, that was my point, that that was a much better justification for their campaign. But that is my justification. It's part of your justification, but it's not... Well, no, I bring to your attention something called the principle of humanity, which is about fundamental human desires. Yes, yeah, yeah, but you... Six but of you, them. You, you, yeah, yes. But, but among them is, is, the, is the right, which you say... Um, well, as a matter of fact, to, I don't think it's in there. It starts with length of life. It goes on to bodily well-being. And there are four more, yes. none, of, none of which I think is an historical claim of a people. Indeed, I know it isn't. So, why, so in that case, why, I said why did, in that I said, case, why I did said, you give it such, I, I such, said, such strong importance in, I said in, something in, in, in your book? I said something in passing, which you have elevated into the doctrine. Okay, well, not. if you want to drop it, that's fine. I will for present purposes, <laughs> yes. Well, I think we, I'm afraid we do have to stop. But can I, um, just in ending, um, thank all, 
all the four speakers who are here for their excellent contributions and also for their very good discipline in the timekeeping. And also in absentia, thank um, Professor Chomsky from, I suppose, Boston. Um, but most of all, can I thank Ted um, both for providing us with the subject matter for this afternoon and also for his excellent and illuminating replies to all the papers and his generosity in, in um, the way he's treated his um, commentators. So thank you very much, Ted, and for